Hey everyone, this is a different kind of video than the ones that I've made before where it was always about a particular topic um, or yeah, to, to show you something. Uh, but this is um, more of a video to talk about my plans and um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about why, uh, why I want to make a video like this. So just uh, for some context, um, I've been working uh, for a couple of weeks only at a robotics company called Zipline. It was very cool. I joined uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, I just hated working from home. Um, I guess a lot of people are struggling with this right now. Uh, but it was especially hard joining a new company. And I realized that I really just need people around me, especially when I'm working. Uh, there's nothing nothing more fun than having a bunch of people in a room uh, making making something cool and being part of that. So I figured that maybe this is just a good time to not work for a while. I'm uh, planning on going to, to Hawaii with some friends. Uh, I'm leaving in a couple of days. Uh, some of them will be working, or at least for some of the time, uh, some of them won't. Um, but I want to work on some projects during this time uh, until things are back to normal and I can actually work with other people in an office again. Uh, or maybe I discovered that this is uh, that, that I want to keep working on projects for longer. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I would say a zipline is very cool if you uh, are looking for a new job and uh, want to work in robotics and especially like a medical uh, delivery, uh, do check them out. Uh, they have a bunch of openings. So the, yeah, the reason is I want some, uh, uh, the, yeah, the reason that I want to make a video like this uh, and also the reason that I want to stay with some friends is to get some structure and accountability. So I am planning on setting some weekly goals around the projects that I'm uh, doing so that I actually have something to work towards and then at maybe at the end of each week, I can make a video of what I accomplished. Um, so that way I have some, uh, something to look forward to, something to work towards um, and some, some feedback from people, uh, both positive and negative. It's just very rewarding if people look at, can look at what you've uh, done and say, oh, this is cool. And have you thought about this and that, um, that, that interactive uh, thing you, you get at work normally. And so I figured maybe I should... Um, uh, do it online uh, to get to yeah to, to get that same structure and accountability. Maybe I can do a little bit of Twitch streaming. Uh, I don't quite know yet. It's a little bit harder to do that if you are um, uh, if, if if you're kind of doing exploratory work. So maybe if I get into a bit more structured programming. It's always more fun to watch something as someone do something that they're very good at, and I don't know if me uh, exploring new libraries and, and stuff like that is, is going to be that interesting. But, but who knows, maybe, maybe I should just get over myself and, uh, and do it anyway, even though I might not feel the most comfortable uh, in that situation. Because it is a good accountability measure, right? You can't really slack off uh, while you're streaming. So it would uh, keep me on my toes. So yeah, let's actually talk about the, the projects that I have in mind. Uh, because I would love to get some some feedback. Maybe you know about uh, some uh, so, some some other projects that relate to this. I would love to hear about it. I haven't done a ton of uh, exploration yet into these ideas. I mean, they are coming from somewhere, so I, I certainly have uh, have some context. But I haven't done super extensive research on on all of these. So. Uh, they all in some some way or most of them relate in some way to WebAssembly. And the reason for that is uh, in the last couple of years, I've worked on several uh, web applications that were very heavy, right? They were um, really pushing the limits of what you can do in the browser and with the DOM and with JavaScript. And it was becoming increasingly clear to me that if you want to do something more or if you want to even build yeah, some of those applications that I've worked on, you really don't want to do that in JavaScript and the DOM. Uh, but there's such a benefit to doing things in the browser because people can very easily uh, open your application. They can share links with each other. Uh, you do get a bunch of nice APIs and you get like nice sandboxing. It will work on every uh, computer 
it will work on a lot of mobile devices. Uh, you have to do a little bit more more work to, to, to make it work well on mobile, but still you get a lot of that stuff for free, but at the cost of performance. And so I think that WebAssembly is the future here, right? For, 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 for complex applications like that. You can run WebAssembly obviously in the browser. It, uh, there's also projects now to run WebAssembly um, on on desktop uh, computers on different operating systems. So you can even use it as a way to to target different um, native systems while still being relatively well sandboxed and not having to do lots of different builds for different APIs. Uh, but it's hard to do this right now, right? There's a couple of different uh, programming languages that you can use for this. But there's not a killer library like uh, what Rails was for Ruby, right? Like Ruby on Rails was the library that really popularized uh, Ruby uh, and made it just very easy to build web servers in it. So I think that there's something here. I don't quite know what um, what the best thing is here. There uh, are a couple of projects that are starting to go in this direction, I think. So uh, literally a few days ago, they came out with uh, Flutter 2. And so this is a framework, uh, a UI uh, framework by Google, where you can make your application once and run it on a lot of different operating systems. They support native, uh, mobile, uh, desktop, and uh, web. And I think for web, they now also support WebAssembly. They used to only support uh, using the DOM. So it would compile to JavaScript and then uh, use the DOM for a lot of the things. Um, so the, here, here are some applications that are built with it. So this is a fairly uh, complex application. You know, you can see some some like uh, uh, lines with with like control points and so on that you can drag around. It's you know this is uh, um, this is this is some interesting stuff, right? So uh, the only problem. In, in my mind with this is it uses Dart, which is uh, garbage collected language. It's not the fastest. It still has to maintain this compatibility with com uh, compiling to JavaScript. So it's being maybe held back a little by that. Uh, but I definitely think that this is a step in the right direction. And then uh, another project that I know of is uh, MakePad. Uh, so uh, I know one of the people who who's working on this. I've met him once uh, back uh, back in the Netherlands. And what they are doing is they're uh, implementing a uh, uh, sort of an interactive editor. So you have this editor where you have sort of this live view. Uh, you can easily add these sort of widgets in the side to, uh, to live change what is going on. And so this is the file that is actually rendering this stuff, right? Uh, so uh, this is this is cool and it looks, it looks like um, something like VS Code or something, but whereas an editor like VS Code is written all in JavaScript and using the DOM, uh, this is written all in Rust. And and they've basically made uh, all the bindings for WebAssembly, but then also for Windows, Mac, and Linux um, to, yeah, to, to use the same rendering engine uh, on all those platforms and the same UI components and so on. And so it basically looks the same on all those platforms, uh, but you actually get the full native speed uh, that a language of Rust gives you if you run the native app. And that is different than a lot of um, apps that like VS Code and, and uh, a lot of other apps like that that are uh, using something like Electron or they might use something something different, but something where you basically take whatever is running in the browser and you put that into a native app. and to, to me, that's sort of the world upside down, right? Like uh, you are working on a, on a native apps, but you're going to use uh, you're going to use JavaScript, right? You're going to use a slow language. But I understand why this is the case because it's so much easier f from a development perspective to do things that way. Uh, it buys you so much if you can just write it once and deploy it anywhere. But now with WebAssembly, we have. Um, I think a way to, to do this right, where we can start with a native fast uh, runtime and then also compile it to WebAssembly as one of the targets. So these are two of the projects that are pretty exciting to me. Um, let's see. Um, 
but I think that there's an opportunity to to maybe do more. So I want to ex- at least explore that. Uh, then there's another idea that I had. So uh, I've been working on this tool called WebVis for a couple of years. This uh, was developed internally at uh, this company uh, called Cruise, which is a self-driving car company. It's part of General Motors. And we had a need there f- uh, to visualize uh, the data that, that was being uh, recorded and generated uh, as the car is driving around. And we managed to build it in a fairly generic way where it's uh, compatible with um, uh, with a lot of robotic systems. And so here we have an open source version of it that is running some data that is not coming from a cruise car, but from uh, some, some other um, publicly available uh, source. And so, yeah, you can see the car driving around, you can kind of like pan around this three, di- uh, three dimensional view, right? We can even sort of scrub uh, at the bottom of the screen here, scrub back and forth and everything updates immediately. So uh, this tool is somewhat generic, uh, but it's still pretty specialized for robotics, uh, but it's highly interactive, right? I can drag these things around and everything immediately updates. And what we're looking at here is uh, gigabytes of data, right? It can ingest, and at Cruise, we would routinely uh, load in gigabytes of data on the client side uh, so that you could very easily uh, open up different um, uh, different uh, charts, different uh, uh, 3D visualizations, uh, different images, and so on um, that were in the data set. And there's like no delay, right? You can just very quickly uh, explore that. So that is on the one end of the spectrum. Uh, we have something like Web is highly interactive, but fairly specialized. And then uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, things like Jupyter Notebook, right? So this um, and Ju- Jupyter Notebook, very popular, uh, especially in data science and regular science and uh, even in robotics as well. Um, it has uh, many, many applications. You basically write little snippets of programs. And so you can do this in Python or Julia or some of the more um, popular ones. Um, you write a little snippet and then uh, you get some output, right? You get maybe a, a, a graph um, or a table or something like that. And the way that that currently works uh, is whenever you run that code, uh, it goes to some backend server. There it runs that Python code or that Julia code, and then it sends back the output, like maybe a little table or uh, an image uh, with, a, with a chart in it, for example. And it's very generic, it's very generic, but it's not super interactive. Right, you have to wait uh, for for these results to come back, and you can't uh, really implement something quite like this in a tool like that, where you just load all this data into the client application, and uh, you just instantiate a bunch of sliders and uh, just scrub through gigabytes of data uh, at will. Right, it's just not really built for that. It's really built for the computation happens on the back end, and then the results are um, uh, streamed back. And uh, the result set can be pretty big and you can do some interactivity there, but it's not quite to the level that we have here. So I'm wondering what it would look like if you would combine those two ideas, right? Where you would say, okay, let's have something like a Jupyter Notebook, but we run it all, uh, all the execution happens inside the browser. Um, and there's some some tools that do this. So there's observable JS uh, is probably what comes closest in terms of it also runs in the browser and so on, but it runs in JavaScript, right? So uh, you can't quite get the same performance, uh, or it takes a lot of work and a lot of tricks to get the same performance like something uh, like WebVis. And then um, if you want to go even further. That there's just no way, right? Like already with WebVis, we were running into the limitations of what you can do in uh, in pure JavaScript, and so we already had to uh, add quite a bit of WebAssembly for um, for certain things. Not quite, not for everything, but for for parts of it. Uh, but if you want uh, full performance and really loading a lot of data and effortlessly uh, uh, scrubbing through it, uh, slicing and dicing it in different uh, ways on the screen you need something faster. You need a faster runtime. And so you would have to do that in uh, in some faster language and then compile it to uh, to WebAssembly or run it as a native application. 
So I'm very curious what that would look like, sort of an observable JS, but done in WebAssembly. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind that has kind of this quality is, is uh, Wolfram's Mathematica. Um, I don't know if there's other tools I would love to hear. I haven't done too much research into, into this yet, um, but that that is one idea. And then sort of underpinning both of these are programming languages, right? Uh, one of the reasons why I think that WebAssembly isn't so popular yet is that uh, to really get the benefit from uh, from the performance that you get uh, from it, you would uh, have to write in uh, C++ or Rust, basically, maybe C. Um, and then there's a bunch more up and coming or obscure languages that you could maybe use for it um, if you want a really fast language, right? Uh, um, such as Zig um, and, and, and a couple of others. Um, but this is underpinning this, right? Like if, if we would have something that would be a bit more in, but like there's, there's kind of a gap, right? On, on the one hand, you have uh, C++ and Rust um, uh, uh, and C and Zig, very low level, uh, very fast if you, uh, if you do things right. Uh, not garbage collected. Um, memory management is mostly manual. Uh, but very fast. And then you have the garbage collected, easy to use languages, right? And that's actually most of the programming languages in the world, right? Including Python and uh, JavaScript and, and so on. Uh, but there's not that much in between where you can say, okay, uh, it's it's really still quite fast, maybe not not as fast, but it's not orders of magnitude away like you have with most garbage collected languages. Uh, and you might be able to do uh, some uh, manual memory management, but in a lot of cases, you don't have to think about it. Um, and it's maybe a little bit harder than JavaScript or Python, but it's not as hard as, as a, a Rust or a C++. So uh, I want to at least do a little bit of research of what is out there, if there is something that we could popularize uh, in the same way that Rails popularized Ruby, because um, there might be just some hidden gems that most people don't, just don't know about yet. And so uh, I certainly don't want to invent my own programming language. That's, uh, that's a very dangerous, a very tempting, but very dangerous thing to do. Um, but uh, may maybe, maybe we can find something that is already there or that's sort of on the right path and uh, help, help out with that effort. So that, that, that's another idea. And then another idea that, that I had is, uh, okay, maybe that is not the solution. Maybe we don't need um, a better programming language that sits sort of in the middle. Uh, maybe we just need better language interop, right? Like maybe we just want to write everything in JavaScript uh, and use the DOM and so on, but make it way easier to just drop in uh, pieces of Rust or C++ wherever you want. Or the other way around, right? Like maybe you want uh, to have like your native application uh, of which a lot of uh, it is written in Rust. And you're already seeing this in, in game engines, for example. It's uh, fairly common that people use uh, a different language. For example, Lua is quite uh, quite popular there um, to do some of the higher level um, reasoning where you don't care so much about performance. Um, but there isn't really anything out there where you can say, this is like one system where you can combine uh, different languages very easily. Basically, what I'm thinking is you want one library that you can, you know, you can go into JavaScript and, and say, I don't know, you know, my uh, universal language interop, uh, I, want, I want to write some Ruby here, or I run, want to write some, some C++ here. Uh, and then you're going to C++ and you want to say, I want to write some JavaScript here. And you just write those lines in line that would be pretty dope. Um, right now, everything is just so tied together with all the built systems and so on. Uh, uh, so it's quite hard to just drop in little snippets wherever you need it. Uh, there's some languages that that have uh, some some of those capabilities, like uh, Cython. You can fairly easily um, uh, use use uh, some C or some variant of C that interoperates fairly well with Python, but uh, this is uh, far from universal, so uh, that's maybe an interesting idea. So yeah, those are those are kind of the ideas that I have. I think I 
we'll be doing very small parts of these, right? Like maybe for the research into different pro uh, programming languages. I'm thinking I could write sort of the same program um, over and over in a bunch of different languages and kind of just get a feel for for what it would be like to uh, uh, to program in in them. Uh, so we would have to come up with a, with a nice uh, example that where, where you get a good sense of it, but it's not too big. Um, but it can't be too small either, because otherwise you don't really get a, a, a feeling for what it's truly like. But maybe for, for the notebook stuff, it's kind of okay if uh, if you just do, do small little snippets, because that is what um, the notebook style programming is also like. So anyway, I haven't quite decided yet what, uh, what the best little you know, weekly goals are, but um, uh, I'm planning on just, just figuring out as we go. And then hopefully uh, doing all of this can also help me a, a bit with my uh, public speaking. Uh, so I'm doing this completely unscripted, which uh, uh, which is kind of scary, um, but it's a, it's a good skill to practice as well. Uh, and then hopefully in a few months, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe I don't make any progress on these things and it's just like a good personal le learning experience. Uh, that's sort of the worst case scenario. And in the best case scenario, uh, maybe we hit on uh, onto something interesting and we can make a real contribution uh, to uh, uh, yeah to the to the world of programming, I guess, or the world of yeah, I don't know. The, a lot of these things have quite a few applications. Uh, you know, I'm kind of coming from like robotics and before that, um, you know, making expert tools um, uh, for, for public transit, for, uh, for example. But, uh, um, you know, uh, that's, that's the nice thing of software, right? It has a very, very broad reach. Okay, uh, I'm, uh, I'm starting to ramble. So let's uh, keep it at this. I would love your feedback. Um, both constructive and yeah, just uh, just let me know what you think and if you if you have any ideas for uh, for how how I could go about it or for projects that I should be uh, looking at that exist already. All right, have a good one. Uh, see ya.